everyone. <laughs> Welcome to Words from the Wild. This week, we're talking about watery ecosystems. <laughs> that includes freshwater lakes, like this one, but also rivers, creeks, wetlands, and of course our tidal ecosystems on the east and west coast of Canada, including tidal pools and mud flats. Are you ready? Let's go. ecosystems. In Canada, we have two kinds of water ecosystems, freshwater and saltwater. Saltwater ecosystems are called marine ecosystems. Let's take a look at our science graphic real quick. In this episode, we're going to be covering a lot of different areas under the umbrella of biology. We're going to talk about ichthyology, which is the study of fish, herpetology, which is the study of reptiles and amphibians, Malacology, which is the study of mollusks. Carcinology, which is the study of crustaceans. Ornithology, which is the study of birds. And marine biology, which you'll remember is the study of all life that lives in marine or saltwater environments. All of these things are going to be used to talk about ecology. That's why this episode is called Watery Ecosystems. Remember that an ecosystem is a biological community. It not only involves all of the living things that are in that ecosystem, but also the environment and the land and the habitat around it. Ecologists are natural scientists that study ecology and ecosystems. Their job is to look at how all of these pieces of the ecosystem fit together and connect. Now, what are some kinds of freshwater ecosystems? Well, we have lakes, obviously. We also have rivers, creeks, and streams. And we have wetlands, things like marshes, swamps, and ponds. What are some examples of saltwater or marine ecosystems? Well, we have tide pools, which you may have heard of, but also tidal flats, salt marshes like the Tantramar marshes near the Bay of Fundy, or estuaries like the St. Lawrence estuary. My plan is to talk briefly about most of these kinds of ecosystems and also break down for you how do you know if they're healthy or unhealthy, and what kinds of wildlife you might find there? So let's start with freshwater ecosystems back at Otter Lake. Come on! So, when you're in a lake, how do you know what makes a healthy lake versus an unhealthy lake? Well, signs of an unhealthy lake could include zebra mussels, Zebra mussels are an invasive species. That means that they're not native to Canada. They were introduced into our lakes through ships ballast and uh, on the bottoms of ships coming through. Another sign of unhealthy lakes are large mats of algae. Weeds are normal, weeds are healthy, but large mats of like slimy green algae, more than the average, that's not healthy. That's often caused by pesticide from people's lawns if they want a really green lawn at their cottage, for example running off into the water table and getting into a lake. What about a healthy lake? A healthy lake includes things like a diversity of weeds, fish, and animal life. You can also tell that the bottom of a lake or a stream is healthy if you were to step on it or you put your kayak paddle into it and air bubbles come out of the mud or out of the weeds. That oxygenation is a good sign. What kinds of things might you find in a lake? Well, let's start with mollusks. Mollusks live in freshwater and saltwater. This is a freshwater snail. Mollusks are invertebrates. Remember that means that they don't have a spine. Mollusks are comprised mostly of things like snails and slugs. But of course, remember in the ocean, we also have things like the nautilus and the octopus. Many mollusks have shells, like this snail. You'll find a lot of empty snail shells if you go snorkeling in Frontenac's lakes, but this one has a living snail inside which you can see if you turn it over. Now I'm gonna be very gentle and I'm gonna put this snail right back where I found it. You might also find a wide variety of fish in lakes in Frontenac, things that people sometimes call crappies. <laughs> Hang on. Is that a water snake? I think so. You guys, our filming's been interrupted by a water snake swimming by. 
And you'll notice that I'm in the water, but I'm not concerned. It's swimming away, and also, water snakes don't mean you any harm. There it goes. There it is. Look, we found a water snake. He's blended in so perfectly. This snake was a northern water snake. Northern water snakes can grow to be between about a meter and a meter and a half long. They are brown or dark brown with faint alternating dark or reddish horizontal striping called banding. I find that it tends to be the older and the longer the snake gets, the less obvious this banding is. The snake we saw wasn't that big. It had very obvious stripes or bands on it. Whereas when a northern water snake gets a bit bigger, it tends to look more just dark brown from a distance. Like this. In Kings and Frontenac, you could confuse the northern water snake with the gray rat snake. The rat snake, however, is really endangered. So if you see a snake that looks dark brown, it's more likely that it's a northern water snake. The gray rat snake is black with faint blotches, whereas the northern water snake is dark brown with the striping or banding that we just talked about. Northern water snakes eat small fish and amphibians like frogs or salamanders. They always live in a body of water or along the shoreline. Even when they hibernate in the winter, they hibernate in dens, burrows, or beaver lodges that are close to the water's edge. The northern water snake is also a fantastic swimmer, as you just saw. They can be found kilometers from shore and up to three meters underwater. Sometimes you may even see a northern water snake swimming, holding a fish in its mouth. Northern water snakes are harmless. Whereas garter snakes will almost never bite you, a northern water snake will bite in self-defense if you're poking it and grabbing it and stuff like that, but you'll hardly even feel it and it will cause no damage. The northern water snake is really common in Kingston Frontenac. Let us know if you've seen one. You might also find a wide variety of fish in lakes in Frontenac. Small fish like the perch or the bluegill, or larger fish like the small and largemouth bass, and even the pike or the muskie. Those are the large fish that have teeth. Some fish, usually the smaller ones, you can see from shore or with a snorkel. When I was snorkeling today, I saw at least 30 tiny fish just swimming around in the weeds having a great time. Some of them even came over and booped my foot. <laughs> also on lakes in Frontenac, you might see birds like the loon, the cormorant, the blue heron, the osprey, and a variety of other migratory species. You may wonder about snakes, turtles, frogs, and stuff like that. I'm actually gonna cover that in next week's episode, which is all about reptiles and amphibians. Okay, now on to our saltwater or marine ecosystems. Remember, none of these can be found in Kingston. The closest saltwater to Kingston is actually in the United States. The coast of New Hampshire or Massachusetts takes around seven hours to drive to. The closest salt water you can get to in Canada is the St. Lawrence Estuary, which I mentioned earlier. It begins to form east of Quebec City, between Rivière du Loup and the Saguenay River. To drive from Kingston to the Saguenay St. Lawrence Marine Sanctuary, for example, it would take eight hours. Still, our tidal marine ecosystems in Canada are so beautiful and unique, I just couldn't leave them out. So I mentioned four marine ecosystems. There are more. But today, we're going to learn about tide pools, tidal mudflats, salt marshes, and estuaries. Let's start with salt marshes and estuaries. These are ecosystems where the water is what we call brackish. Fresh water and salt water are mixing here. How exciting! 
salt marshes and estuaries form where freshwater sources, like rivers or wetlands, meet the salt water of our oceans. There is a third type of brackish tidal ecosystem, and those are mangrove forests. We don't have mangroves in Canada because they are tropical ecosystems, but you can find mangrove forests throughout Southeast Asia, Africa, Australia, and South America. So why are brackish marine ecosystems important? Well, because they are unique and special, and because many animals rely on them for shelter, food, and a safe place for the young. The plants that grow in salt marshes reach their roots and stems down into the salty water and create maze-like, shallow shelters for baby fish, crabs, mollusks, and shrimp. These plants also provide lots of nutrients to the ecosystem as they age and decay. Some marine species, such as herring, stickleback, blue crab, or flounder, just to name a few, need estuaries and salt marshes to survive growing up. You may also find mammals like shrews, mice, voles, raccoons, and river otters. And in the St. Lawrence estuary, remember that's where the St. Lawrence River meets the Gulf of St. Lawrence and that fresh and salt water begins to mix, you might see blue whales, humpback whales, dolphins, and even seals coming in from the Atlantic to look for food in these comparatively sheltered waters. The St. Lawrence estuary even has its own resident population of beluga whales. Salt marshes and mangroves especially are important for us humans too. Those sturdy plants have roots that are binding the sand and mud and making the shoreline much stronger. Without these plants and coastal buffers, hurricanes and floods would do much more damage to our coastal towns. Without salt marshes and mangroves, the sand and mud of our intertidal areas would erode. Remember that erosion is when water wears away at the land. Erosion can create amazing landforms when softer sediment or softer rock gets eroded, leaving the shape of the harder rock or the harder land behind, such as in the Bay of Fundy. Next, let's talk about tidal mudflats. Mudflats happen when there is a long, large tide that goes out, leaving a great big expanse of mud that, usually most of the day, is underwater. It gets exposed for part of the day or night by low tide. This is a picture of my brother and I exploring the mudflats that form in the Bay of Fundy in New Brunswick. No plants grow on mudflats, but the mud has the same buffering effect as the mangroves or the marshes that I talked about earlier. They protect our shoreline. Mudflats might look boring. After all, it just looks like a field of mud. But there is a lot living unseen beneath the surface. Creatures like zooplankton and microscopic organisms live in the mud, making it rich with nutrients. Other creatures burrow in the soft muck and have breathing tubes sticking up into the air. All those tiny holes in the mud that you see in mudflats, deep underneath those there might be things like parchment worms, clams, moon snails, other bivalves, and mollusks. You might see creatures like crabs or wading birds like the plover, the sandpiper, or the greater yellow legs. Tidal mudflats provide an important and irreplaceable habitat for all of these species. One thing you don't want to see in any marine ecosystem in Canada is the green crab. The green crab is what's called an invasive species. That means it doesn't belong in Canadian ecosystems, and it is aggressive in taking over. Green crabs are actually bad for our important marine ecosystems just like zebra mussels are bad for our freshwater ecosystems in Ontario. Now, I saved the most exciting for last. Tide pools, sometimes called rock pools or tidal pools, are pools of water left in rocky shorelines when the tide goes out. Looking in tide pools for marine life is some of the best fun I've ever had. In Canada, you can find tide pools on both the east and west coast, and the kinds of animals you might find in them include hermit crabs, sea anemones, which have wavy tentacles of many colors, but sometimes if you see them in a tide pool, they might be all collapsed inside of themselves while they wait for the water to come back, so they look like this. Sea urchins are spiky balls of colorful spines. In Canada, they're usually a dark purple. Chitons 
These are mollusks that have a segmented shell and an oval shape, and you'll usually see them suctioned really hard onto rocks. Jellyfish? Though when you see them, they'll probably be lying flat, like this one. Don't assume a jellyfish is dead just because it looks like this. It might be stranded, but it can survive until the tide comes back. Barnacles? Snails? Even sea cucumbers, like this one. A rare and exciting find in a tide pool would be a sea slug. The big science word for a sea slug is nudibranch. Nudibranches come in many amazing colors and designs. It's actually hard to believe. This is a sea slug, and this is a sea slug, and this is a sea slug, and so are these. The biggest sea slug, the black sea hare, can be almost 100 centimeters long and weigh up to 14 kilograms. That is a big slug. Finally, the most common thing you'll find in tide pools, after snails, I suppose, are sea stars or starfish. Sea stars are not fish, and they are not mollusks. We've talked a lot about mollusks already. Sea stars are not mollusks. They actually belong to a group of creatures called echinoderms. Echinoderms are invertebrates. Remember, that means they have no spine or no backbone. They have arms radiating out from their center, and their mouths are hiding underneath. Some sea stars only have five arms, but some, like British Columbia's massive sunflower star, can have up to 24. The sunflower star can also grow to almost a meter wide. Some other common sea stars of Canadian tide pools include the bat star, so-called because its arms appear more webbed than that of other starfish, the northern sea star, usually a dark purplish color, and the ochre sea star, which is really common in British Columbia. The ochre sea star comes in three colors, orange, purple, and dark red. Having three colors like this in one species is called polymorphism. Biologists don't know why this happens exactly. It may have to do with genetics, or it may have to do with diet. Purple may be the default color for ochre sea stars, but the larger they get, the more likely they are to be orange or red. It's a mystery! And mysteries like that are why I love biology so much. There's still so much that we don't know about our wild world. So, today we've talked about freshwater lakes, a little bit about the rivers and wetlands that are attached to them. We've talked about salt marshes and estuaries and brackish water, a mix of fresh and salt. We've talked about the importance of intertidal ecosystems like mudflats and tide pools and how important they are for a unique group of living things. Here are the indigenous words for lake and river. Remember that water is important and sacred. All of our watery ecosystems in Canada are connected. By the water cycle, yes, but also by the never-ending flowing and changing of water around and across the land. So many unique and wonderful plants and animals rely on our watery ecosystems and it's more important than ever for you to learn about them so that you can keep them clean and protect them fiercely for generations to come. Well, that concludes our watery ecosystems episode of Words from the Wild. If you want to learn more about freshwater or marine ecosystems, I recommend checking out the BBC documentary series Blue Planet or Blue Planet 2, narrated by David Attenborough. For books, I recommend the Exploring the Great Lakes series, The Science of Wetlands, or Marine Science for Kids. If you want to talk more about watery ecosystems or things you found while exploring them, or you just have any questions about nature in general, join us at Words from the Wild Live on Monday afternoons. Well, Stay wild, everyone! What about sharks? <laughs> I don't know, I think it's kind of dorky, Mom. <laughs> about those wild, exotic animals. Okay, bye! You keep... Skirting the shark question. There's no sharks!